Today on The Global African, we'll talk to protesters here in Baltimore about their demands on the city. We'll also talk about the recent elections in Canada. That's Today on The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. Thanks for joining us. Don't go anywhere. Canada's recent election exposed how far removed both the Conservative and Liberal parties are. The election cycle had the highest voter turnout since 1993. On the Conservative side, incumbent Prime Minister Stephen Harper campaigned on the slogan, that's not how we do things here, in a not so veiled attack on Islamic culture. In September of this year, the Harper-led government announced that they were looking to overturn an appeals court ruling that allowed for Muslim women to wear hijabs while performing their citizen oath. Harper made it a point to prey on Islamophobia, saying, quote, the international jihadist movement has declared war, unquote. This was also coming at a time in which the Harper government passed Statute C-51, a shadowy piece of legislation that criminalizes political expression. Justin Trudeau, the liberal candidate, addressed Harper's cynical tactics in his acceptance speech, saying, quote, My friends, we beat fear with hope. We beat cynicism with hard work. We beat negative divisive politics with a positive vision that brings Canadians together, unquote. But while Trudeau has rightly condemned the Conservative Party's racist demagoguery, he has isolated communities of color, blaming black culture for violence against women. He has cited the influence of, quote, certain kinds of music, unquote, and single parent homes in certain communities as the cause for Canada's violence against women of color and trans women. His campaign has also failed to set any goals to curb greenhouse gas emissions, and his party supported the passage of Statute C-51. Today we will be looking at the impact of Canada's elections on the Canadian people and the Canadian people of color in particular. So join us. We're joined by Jenea Khan, who is a co-founder of Black Lives Matter Toronto, an organization committed to black liberation, transformative justice, and indigenous sovereignty. Um, well, let's talk about the Canadian elections. I, uh, <coughs> I uh, was following the lead up. Uh, the Canadian elections were longer than uh, normal for Canada, very short by US standards. I, I just wish that I was in Canada to experience that. And uh, there was a great voter turnout and Harper got his rear end kicked. What's your analysis of what happened? Um, I think that what I saw was, I mean, you could see this leading up. The last voter turnout was around 61%. Uh, and before that, it was in the 50s, which was a dramatic drop from the 80s and the uh, late 1950s. Um, we were anti-Harper mania in Canada. Uh, I think really looking at the legislation, his foreign policy, um, his rampant Islamophobia, I think those things made it really clear. Trudeau definitely got elected largely because people did not want to vote for Harper. And the NDP has turned into a very central group as opposed to owning the left in the ways that they should have. Mm. Um, and so Trudeau mania definitely took over in a lot of ways. I've seen more memes coming out on social media around how attractive he is more than his actual uh, platform, political platform and uh, policies he's looking to implement. So um, I think the voter turnout, yeah, was largely due to fear of what Harper would be bringing about. I think the other major thing to bring up, though, is the reality that Harper didn't lose by that much uh, in the major scheme of things. And his one of his major platforms was very anti-Muslim. And the fact that that is not something that's been widely contested in Canada is very, very telling. Where were there surprises, either way, good or bad, in the elections? The surprises were around how many visible minority MPs got elected. Um, I want to be really clear on that. I think it's important uh, that we have uh, representation. But two major things really stand out for me around uh, our visible minority uh, MPs. One is it didn't happen as a conscious effort. It happened largely because it happened more by happenstance in switching to liberals uh, more visible minority MPs ended up being uh, entering into parliament as opposed to a concerted effort. Mm -hmm. And two, of those visible minorities, 
uh, they're largely not black. And so it's it's very telling, I think, of anti-black racism in Canada. It's very telling around the ways in which uh, the black experience in Canada differs than any other racialized group aside from the indigenous people. What are, when you say they're largely not black, <clears throat> what are they? Uh, South Asian, uh, East Asian, uh, uh, Atlantic Pacific Islander, um, but largely South Asian. Um, and I think those are also representative of the particular regions that they're in, but uh, the, the fact that overwhelmingly we have not seen historically black MPs uh, is responsive to the types of anti-black racism that exists in Canada. And like, we need to be really critical of the types of successes that are happening when they're incumbent on the continued erasure of black people. Now, once upon a time uh, in the British Commonwealth, uh, it was, and, and actually in parts of the United States, it was not uncommon for South Asians to identify as black. Uh, is that not the case in Canada now? Certainly not. Um, I actually had a, I was part of a caravan for justice out here, uh, and we had people from the UK come through. Um, and I'll be going out to the UK in November. And I know that that's very much still people, uh, still a thing. People are identifying politically as black. Um, in order to sort of further the movements, but that's not been the experience in Canada. I think that within a narrative of people of color, it is black people who are continuously misrepresented or not represented at all, uh, who exist on the, on the very bottom of the lower archy, if you will. Um, and realistically, it's black folks who are most marginalized in the country alongside with indigenous folks. We need only look to incarceration rates. We, don't, we need only look to who is being brutalized as, uh, by police in order to sort of deduce that something is happening in a way that is not conducive to social justice. So let's talk then about the ramifications or potential ramifications of the election. And um, I'm interested in, in actually a couple of things. One is... Uh, the legislation C-51, and uh, which when I first read about it and heard about it, uh, I, I, was, I was amazed that something so authoritarian and so openly authoritarian uh, was able to pass your parliament. And so I'd like to know a little bit about that and if you could explain to the audience about that. But the other is the ramifications of the election on uh, communities of color in Canada? So Bill C-51 is our anti-terror bill. Um, it's draconian, uh, it is very much anti-Muslim, it's uh, anti sort of protest, it's, uh, it allows for citizens to have their status revoked. Now, even in the United States, uh, when you're looking at terrorism charges, it's not part of the policy that you would lose your citizenship. And here, that can happen for immigrants and uh, who receive uh, permanent residence and uh, citizen status. Uh, and it can also happen for first generation Canadians. Um, it's terrifying the way that the language has shifted along Bill C-51 also indicates that they don't need to have large sort of a large platform of suspicion in order for you to be sort of interrogated and charged with terrorism in the country. Um, what is really alarming is the NDP is the only uh, group that was directly in opposition uh, till, to Bill, Bill C-51. Um, and they are the, also the only group that promised to have it sort of removed uh, immediately within 10 to 100 days. And so it's not been a platform of the Liberal Party necessarily to have it removed entirely or even have it altered. Uh, the anti-terror bill as it is needs to be completely abolished. The impact of the elections on people of color in the city, it's complicated. Um, I think that, to be honest, uh, for the black vote, uh, for black uh, Canadians in the country, it has very little impact. Um, outside of one thing, I think we are at a pivotal point in Canadian history. Uh, what we saw recently is the promise to end carding. Now, carding is a practice that is consistent with uh, the United States' stop and frisk. It allows for arbitrary and random checks of individuals um, and allows for police officers to stop and detain you and to also collect your information and put that in a system, um, which ironically enough hasn't worked in our favor around data collections. But we do know that black people are 
three times more likely to be carded than any other population of people, uh, that it disproportionately targets indigenous people and disproportionately targets racialized people. And so, uh, you know, we've had lawyers from the top down fighting that. We've been fighting carding on the ground, and now we're getting a promise uh, that it is going to be uh, amended. I think it's too soon to call it a success or a win yet until we see what the policy actually looks like. Um, but I do believe that that was a direct, as a direct result of the elections. Um, I do believe that was a direct result of the pressure that Black Lives Matter Toronto and a few other organizations have been putting that on the ground, the pressure that has been happening on the ground, and also the pressure that has been happening on a parliamentary and sort of, uh, you know, level where lawyers and advocates exist. So um, I think we're at a precipice uh, where we can really push reform and push change in a way that is transformative or continue to uh, exist in this sort of erasive colonial past that Canada is deeply, deeply invested in. I heard uh, incoming Prime Minister Trudeau's, I guess, acceptance speech. And, and then I subsequently heard uh, that he had made statements or has made statements that are anti-black. What's that about? So, I mean, for one, in Trudeau's acceptance speech, he talks about, you know, different sort of anti-oppressive issues, but never once names and mentions racism. I think that's a, that's an incredibly important sort of important uh, blind spot. Um, and the other thing is the comments that he made were specifically around, uh, you know, single parent households and, um, you know, domestic violence, and he specifically said that the reason they, they exist in the way that they do, and that in the numbers that they do, is because of rap music. And, you know, as we know, there's lots of ways in which anti black racism manifests itself. Nowadays, you can talk and be very much uh, in cahoots with anti black racism without ever having to say the word black. Um, and so we know that rap music is uh, specifically talking about black populations. I think that is a very problematic statement. It's definitely in like deeply, deeply uh, misinformed at the least. Um, and it's it, what it really does is it suggests that the black family is inherently uh, violent and tragic. And so his inability to see that and make those kinds of connections led to him being directly challenged um, in particular ways, but I think is very, very consistent with the type of anti-black racism that we see in Canada, which is friendly contempt in a lot of ways. Communities of color, is, are there alliances between major organizations in the various communities of color, the First Nations, the people of African descent, Asians, et cetera? Are there alliances? They're very much in development. They've always existed, those histories of resistance uh, in Canada. But uh, with the ways in which Black Lives Matter Toronto is shaping the narrative around uh, anti-black racism and also aligning ourselves directly with uh, what Indigenous sovereignty can look like, I think we've really shifted the game a lot. Um, I do believe that change is coming. I don't believe it's going to come at the governmental level. I think that people on the ground are really waking up. I think we're focusing on critical, critical connections over critical mass. Um, so the objective, though Toronto can mobilize really easily, where we can have a call out and get thousands of people on the streets, what we're really understanding is the type of coalition building that needs to happen so that we're not continuing to operate and exist in silos. The reality is whether or not we're making the connections we need to, uh, governmental levels, the imperialist, you know, white supremacist state that we live in, they are making those connections and we have to be uh, more ardent and uh, provide vigor in our work in ways that we never have before. So um, alliances, coalitions, solidarity movements, they are happening. Uh, the advent of Black Lives Matter as an international movement has really uh, lit a flame all around the world. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited for what's going to be happening. I know that with Indigenous and Black people, there's a narrative that t t tends to exist around stolen land versus stolen labor. Uh, that type of singularity of our movements has immobilized us in the past, and I think we're really moving beyond that and seeing that um, the ways in which anti-Black racism looks at the specific historical, socioeconomic, and political conditions of Black and Indigenous people has really shifted the narrative um, and aligned us in ways like never before. 
All right. Well, Janea Khan, thank you very much for joining us on The Global African. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you very much for joining us for this segment of The Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher. We'll be back in a moment. Activists in Baltimore have been in a constant battle to address police brutality and other forms of institutionalized racism. On October 14th, young protesters occupied City Hall during and after City Council's official approval of Kevin Davis as police commissioner. Kevin Davis became interim police commissioner in July after the firing of Anthony Batts. Davis has come under fire for his support of aggressive policing, particularly over the last several months. On October 17th, 16 protesters were handcuffed and arrested for occupying public grounds. This sparked a greater need for change with one protester shouting, quote, you probably thought to yourself that you were going to change these things and here you are keeping things the same, unquote. That's what we're going to explore in a moment. Our guest here is Trey Murphy, who is a student at Bowie State University and an organizer with the Baltimore Algebra Project. The Algebra Project is an, a nationally known effort, a youth-run organization committed to promoting math literacy and changing the education system to meet the needs of all students. Trey, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Great. Oh, it's our pleasure. So uh, things in the mainstream media, as far as the mainstream media is concerned, Baltimore has sort of moved off of the screen. But you've been involved in an effort that has been pushing Baltimore back into the news. So what is the struggle around a police commissioner? So, you know, I think a part of it, um, and actually, first and foremost, thank you again for having me. One of the, uh, one of the interesting things um, is that under, the, under this uh, police commissioner predecessor, uh, Anthony Batts, who was the former police commissioner of Baltimore, uh, police department before he got fired by the mayor. Mm -hmm. uh, under his tenureship and his leadership, we haven't seen such an agitation or, or over aggressiveness to uh, protest, right? Um, when Kevin Davis took over as interim police commissioner, one of the first things that we noticed was peaceful protesters began to get arrested and charged and over-criminalized and charged with ridiculous uh, charges that just didn't make sense. Example. That, that's what people mean by aggressive policing? Correct. Um, so one so one example is Kwame Rose mm -hmm. um, in particular. Um, so folks may have heard the story around him. It was this nationally blown up thing um, where he got arrested um, during uh, one of the protests at the pretrial hearings for the Freddie Gray case. Mm -hmm. um, and he was charged with, uh, with assault of a police officer um, when on video you can clearly see that he didn't resist an arrest or anything like that. So one of the things that was said to Kwame directly um, Kwame Rose directly when he was arrested was that they had received a direct order from higher up to make an example out of protesters, right? And that's troublesome for community organizers, um, youth organizers, activists inside the city who see themselves as insurgencies, um, as insurgents uh, for change, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that, that begins to trouble us. And so what we're saying is that if you are going to accept this job, if you're going to be inside this position where your job requires you to preserve the rights of individual people, individual citizens in the city of Baltimore, that's not how you do it, by over-criminalizing protesters, by trying to deter and demean protests inside of Baltimore. So that's interesting. So, so aggressive policing then has nothing to do with going after criminals. It's about stomping on people who are protesting. Now you, um, this movement, uh, advance what, 19 demands or something? Um, so explain, how did that happen? Inside of Baltimore, it was three demands. Um, one, the first one was that the Baltimore Police Commissioner, uh, interim police commissioner, who was then in time now police commissioner, Kevin Davis implement 19 rules of engagement. The second mm -hmm. one uh, was that uh, that the mayor fired the uh, housing director, housing commissioner uh, Graziano uh, for the sexual assault cases that are pending his uh, department and the fact that he has not been effective inside of his position um, that he's been in for over a decade now. And then the third one was that uh, was that $20 million 
uh, be reallocated to educational programming. That 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 money is uh, is institutionally controlled by grassroots groups who have been involved inside of protests, who understands uh, what is going on. So talking about the four groups who was a part of last week's protest, protest the Alger Project, the um, Baltimore Block, Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle, um, and City Block, right? So those four groups would be the hub for figuring out where that money go to. So what we said was that there are 19 rules of engagements that we feel um, are adequate that are not with, um, without of your reach to implement. Um, and so here are these 19 rules of engagement. And very simple stuff uh, ranging from uh, the preservation of human life over property to uh, not using riot gear, right? Mm -hmm. um, and tear gas only as a last resort for the preservation of human life. Um, to making sure that there's a community liaison that works directly with a police liaison so that there's constant communication flowing and we can try to get a hold of situations as they emerge as opposed to you guys coming in, guns blazing, which provokes a response from everyday citizen, led us to people who they trust. Um, and who they know best and who they have developed relationships with to be the ones to talk to them, to make sure that uh, whatever situations arise that we can deal with it in the most strategic way that preserves human life and does not deepen the conflict that already exists inside of a community uh, as it relates to the police department. Right, so all of these various, 19 of them, all these various different demands that was not without of the police commissioners reach to implement, to say, hey, this is a good faith. And that ultimately did not happen. Um, for a number of reasons, the police commissioner chose to disrespect the young people's voice and go back on his word after he had committed to implement 19 rules of engagement and even added one on to them himself. Um, so wait a minute. So the police commissioner accepted the 19, adds one, and then blows the whole thing off? But what did he say? I mean, how did he explain going back on his word? So he, uh, he hasn't put out a statement since his first one. As I, as I understand everything to this. Uh, when we called uh, one of the uh, representatives, uh, one of his, uh, Lieutenant uh, Russell, um, I'm, I'm forgetting his first name, but Lieutenant Russell, uh, who had set up the meeting with us, what was conveyed to us uh, was that he didn't understand, right? Um, and to me, that makes no type of sense because you added a rules of engagement on and you committed to sending us a press statement by noon, even if you didn't understand, to make sure that everything was in understanding amongst both sides, right? Um, so it's just, it's lie after lie. Um, it's what it feels like to me, and, I, and I, I'm sure I speak for the protesters who was there. It's disrespect after disrespect. It's what it feels like, um, and it's ultimately deepening the divide that already exists between community and police. Okay, so one of the things that's interesting here is that this, this movement is bringing together, it's not just a movement around police lynchings and police abuse, it's you're bringing together other issues like this issue of housing. And uh, so how did, how did the, the decision come about to, to link these issues? One of the things that we said is that, um, is that all of these things stem from a human rights framework, mm. right? Um, and people should have basic necessities um, because they're human and because they are humane, right? And so one of the things that we recognize is that with the, with the movement for black lives, nationally right. been out there, been a thing that's, uh, that's talked about around race relations inside this country. We know that race relations uh, extend far beyond just police, right, and just the police department. It extends into all of these other systems that create this structural racism mm -hmm. um, system that was created by a white supremacy framework, right? Um, and so what we said was that it's not enough for us to just try to, to talk about one issue without talking about how it relates to all of these other issues that disenfranchise people of color every day. 
So the housing issue uh, is one thing that we recognize that if people don't have access to basic housing, right, to quality housing, they're more prone to fall to to, to the streets, right, mm -hmm. um, or more, more prone to fall to some of the negative factors that we try to prevent every day. Um, and so that so so. The fact that uh, that the housing department, the Baltimore City Housing Department, has taken advantage of people in public housing um, in poor and impoverished neighborhoods um, is a direct attack on people's humanity. What we're saying is that this, these are basic humane issues, right? Things that everybody should be should be paying closely attention to, uh, because all three of these things are connected under that human rights framework, because it all plays a part in structural racism. Trey Murphy, thank you very, very much for joining us in the Global African and talking with us about this. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us for this episode of the Global African. I'm your host, Bill Fletcher, and we'll see you next time. Take care.